Let me introduce you to a strange number, the square root of zero. Some of you might say this is clearly zero, but let's reserve the judgment a bit. Other numbers get to have two square roots, so why not zero? So let's imagine this is a number distinct from zero, and let's call it the square root of zero. How can we imagine this number? Well, we can imagine that it is a really small number, an infinitesimally small number. A number so tiny that its square is actually zero. This makes sense, because normally, really small numbers get even smaller when we square them. We can then imagine that the square root of zero is at some, is at some level of tiny that we actually care about it, but its square is so small we don't, and call it zero. So, we have this intuition that square root of zero is some really tiny number. So what can we do with really tiny numbers? Well, calculus uses really tiny numbers. Let's try to derive something using the square root of zero. Normally, we derive using this limit. Let's remove the limit, and replace the epsilon with the square root of zero. Let's have f be the square function, and let's compute the value of this expression. We get 2x! This is the derivative of x squared. Let's try with x cubed. We get 3x squared! In fact, this works for any power function, that is, functions that take x to some natural po number power. Since, for instance, the exponential function can be written as a sum of power functions using the Taylor polynomial formalism, we can even do this to the exponential function. If you compute this, we will actually get the exponential function, which is its derivative. With this, we're doing calculus without any limits. Note that there are some finer points we are ignoring here, such as how division by the square root of zero only works in certain cases, and that x must be a real number. From now on, since square root of zero is a little long, let's call this number epsilon. So what can we do with epsilon? Well, we can multiply it with any real number, and we can add real numbers to it. From this, we can see that we get numbers of the form a plus b epsilon, where a and b are real numbers. These numbers, again, can be added in the way that we would if epsilon were a variable, and they can be multiplied using the distributive rule, and that epsilon squared is equal to zero. We recognize this structure. This is a ring. We have a set of elements, and we can add and multiply them. If you don't know what a ring is, watch my previous video, or you can try to Google it. This ring of epsilon together with real numbers is called the dual numbers. The dual numbers are also called r extended by epsilon modulo epsilon squared. We will explain in detail what all of this means. First of all, r extended by epsilon is the ring of real polynomials using the variable epsilon. Taking modulo epsilon squared essentially means that in this ring we set epsilon squared equal to zero and continue computing as they would be polynomials, but set in zero instead of epsilon squared whenever it arises, including when it arises in epsilon cubed or epsilon to the fourth power. This is similar to how complex numbers are defined. They can be called r extended by i modulo i square squared plus one. Here we set i squared plus one equal to zero, which is the same as setting i squared equal to minus one. The fine details of how ring modulo something is defined we will leave for later, but it essentially builds on something called ideals and cosets of those ideals. All you really need to know is that when whatever comes after the modulo is set to zero and all arithmetic builds on that. Another important ring defined in this manner is the Gaussian integers. These are the integers, but including the imaginary unit i. This ring can be called z extended by i modulo i squared plus 1. Another, another similar example is z extended by square root of 2, or z extended by x modulo x squared minus 2. These are the integers together with the square root of 2. We could also do q extended by square root of 2, which is the same, but with rational numbers instead of integers. Note that these rings are actually very different from their base counterpart, as for instance with the Gaussian integers, we have 5 equal to 2 minus i times 2 plus i. So 5 is no longer a prime number, but other combinations of integers and the imaginary unit can be. In general, we can do r extended by x modulo px for any ring r and any polynomial px with coefficients in r. 
In fact, we can also have multiple variables, such as r extended by x and y modulo x times y minus 1. In this ring, we have x plus y squared equal to x squared plus y squared plus 2. Note that here, the x and the y are not elements of r extended by x and y, but the specific elements x and y. In even further generality, we can do any ring r modulo any element of r. So these polynomial rings are created by exactly the same formalism as set modulo 5. It is worth noting that when it comes to addition, r extended by x modulo p of x looks like a vector space over r with dimension the same as the degree of p. In particular, if r has a finite amount of elements s, then r extended by x modulo p has a finite amount of elements s to the d, where d is the degree of the polynomial p. We will now try to explain a set of very important rings called the finite fields. To begin, we must first understand what a field is. A field is a commutative ring such that every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. That is, for each number x, not including zero, there is another element y, such that x times y equals 1. This translates into that division is always possible. Examples of fields are the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. The p-adic numbers are also a field, as are the algebraic numbers. The integers are not a field, since division isn't always possible. z modulo n is a field if and only if n is a prime number, otherwise it is just a commutative ring. So for instance, in z mod 5, 3 is invertible because 3 times 2 is 1, and it turns out that all numbers in set modulo 5 are invertible in this manner. A finite field is then a field which only consists of a finite number of elements. Indeed, we can classify these fields by exactly how many elements they have, and it turns out for that a given size, all finite fields of that size are isomorphic. Since they are isomorphic, we can think of them as essentially the same, and so all the fields of size n go by the same name, Fn or GFFn, for Galois field, as they are sometimes called. However, there are some sizes for which there are no finite fields. For instance, 6. There is no field which has size 6. We do, however, know, already know one example of a finite field, and that is set modulo p, where p is a prime number. We already dis discussed that these rings are fields. So we know that there are finite fields of size any prime number, but are, are there more? Well, earlier in this episode we explored ring extensions, so perhaps we can add more elements to set modulo p and get other sizes. Well, let's look at set modulo p extended by x modulo of polynomial f. When is this a field? Well, it turns out that when we begin with a field and modulo out an irreducible polynomial, we get a new field. An irreducible polynomial is a polynomial which cannot be factored in the ring that we are working with. Of course, all polynomials can be factored, but if we restrict ourselves to the real numbers, for instance, the polynomial x squared plus 1 cannot be factored and is thus irreducible. So let be, let's begin with set modulo p and extend by x and modulo out an irreducible polynomial f of degree d. We now know that this is a new field, but what size is it? Well, the elements are polynomial and take the form a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, and so on, up to d, where each a n is an element in z modulo p. So we have d numbers for which there are p choices of value. This is p to the d choices in total. So we see that we have p to the d elements in z modulo p extended by x modulo f, and since this is a field, we have a field of size p to the d, so we can see that this is any prime, not power. All that remains to show is that there is always an irreducible polynomial of any degree d. We won't show this in this video, but it is indeed true. For instance, to get a finite field of size 4, we begin with set modulo 2, and extend by a variable x, and modulo out x squared plus x plus 1, which is a known degree 2 irreducible polynomial. It turns out that there are no more finite fields than those with prime power size. Thank you for the attention, I hope you learned something, and leave a comment if you have any questions. Subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of content, and I hope to see you again.